Welcome to the Way Ministries Bible Study with Pastor John. Tonight's study will be in the book of Job. We invite you to join us at 1 Oakley Avenue in North Providence, Rhode Island. This podcast is presented to you by the Way Ministries, supported by listeners like you. For donations, live videos, podcasts, and more, please visit www.thewayministriesri.org. Thank you and have a great day. First and foremost, just thank all the other students. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into our lives, saving us from ourselves, Lord, and doing for us we can never, ever do for ourselves. I'd like to thank the Florida ministry, my body. Many parts. Many parts. We all need this to function properly. If you have a cell phone, please silence it so it doesn't disturb tonight's study. And we'll start with the word of prayer. <coughs> Dear Lord Jesus, Abba Father, we're just so grateful and so thankful and so blessed to live in this country, Lord. And to gather together tonight to worship you, to honor you, and to glorify you, Lord. And to become more and more like you, Lord. Help us to make your ways our ways by crucifying our flesh, emptying our minds of the world, and finish filling our minds with your word, Lord. So we can build your kingdom and glorify you, Lord. Help us to remain humble and teachable like claim your hands, Father. So we can become more like Jesus, Father. So we can glorify you and help build your kingdom. We pray for the nation Israel and all the war that's going on around the world, Lord, that you bring peace to that, Lord. Help bring unity to the churches, Lord, by sticking to the Bible as the owner's man. And get rid of all the religion that's out there, Father. And we're just so grateful and thankful that we have a precious girl here, Lord. Let us always be responsible and accountable to it, Lord. And as always, let everybody be led by your spirit tonight, Lord, and not our flesh. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, we're going to stand for it. We're going to come up and sing when we get started.
does do great things. Amen. Yes. Every day. Amen. Miracles. Yes and amen. Yes. All right, how's everybody doing tonight? All right, good. good to see everybody. Yes, good to be here. Right? The weather's starting to break now. I don't think it's going to get any more warm on now. <coughs> but I like the seasons. I like the fall. All right, we are going to continue our study in the book of Job. Before we get started there, though, we're going to go in Psalm 119, the beautiful psalm there. We recommend everybody reads that psalm. It's an awesome psalm. The longest one, too. Mm -hmm. But there's so much insight there. The Holy Spirit will be taken over as they go into these scriptures. So try to clear your minds of the day. Prepare your heart to receive the message the Spirit is trying to say to the church tonight. Amen? Amen. Okay. Verse 1, Psalm 119. Joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil, and they walk only in his paths. You have charged us to keep your commandments carefully, all oh, that my actions would constantly reflect your decrees. So he's saying, what comes out of me and how I act should what? Bring glory to him. Then I will not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands or with your word. As I learn your righteous regulations, I will thank you by being a good boy. <laughs> oh, it's not in there. <laughs> I will thank you by living as I should. By living as I should. How do we want to thank the Lord? By living a life worthy of the call. Amen. That's how we thank him. I will obey your decrees. Please don't give up on me. I love that one right there. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many times I give up on myself. You know, knowing that, you know, we try to do the right thing all the time. And we just got this flesh that's so stubborn and evil. It just reacts when it wants. It just comes out like, like a volcano. It just it erupts at any given time. Mm -hmm. I love it. Please don't give up on me. Look at verse 9. How can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word. I have tried hard to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. We're all prone to what? Wander from the word of God. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I praise you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. I have recited aloud all the regulations you have given us. I have rejoiced in your laws as much as in riches. I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. How many times, you know, we read the Bible, right? But how many times do we forget what we read? It's just a natural thing, you know, even when I listen to the daily walk. I say, well, what was that about? And then I forget and I get away. I better go and listen to it again. Because <laughs> I get preoccupied, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Sometimes I'm tuned into it really good or sometimes there's other things tuning into my head that stops me from getting the message. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like traffic. Yeah, like traffic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm getting better at traffic. Yeah, you are. I got no choice. See, that would be miserable for the rest of my life. So I say, you know what? I better, I better learn how to, you know, accept it. Because it's not getting any better, that's for sure. I see more people drooling than anything else now at the steering wheel. Yeah, no, Instead of just driving from point A to point B. Or they're preoccupied with the phone or whatever it might be. I'm a point A to point B driver. Get in my car. I want to get to where I got to go. Without being distracted. Yep. But now we get the cell phones. They tell you not to use them while you're driving. You see everybody using them. Yeah, right. Well, even the cops are using them. Yeah. So nobody's going to listen to it. You see them on there more than anybody else. <laughs> So, true. you know how it's getting. It's becoming a lawless society. That's yep. what it's becoming. It is. They tell you to do something, but there's no penalties anymore for when you do it. So, there's, when there's no punishment, there's no, uh, there's no change. All right. So it says right here, I will verse 16, I will delight in your decrees 
and not forget your word. Be, to your, be good to your servant, that I might live and obey your word. Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. <laughs> I try to get by it, but I can't. That, that truth right there. <laughs> truths in your instructions. I am only a foreigner in the land. Don't hide your commands from me. I am always overwhelmed with the desire for your regulations. You rebuke the arrogant. Those who wander from your commands are cursed. Don't let them scorn and insult me, for I have obeyed your laws. Even princes sit and speak against me, but I will meditate on your decrees. Your laws please me. They give me wise advice. So if you want good wise advice, we get it from what? The Word of God. Mm -hmm. Not from people. That's for sure. Yeah. Worldly wisdom has nothing to do with God's wisdom, for sure. <clears throat> Verse 25. I just wanted to say this one simple. I lie in the dust. Revive me by your word. I told you my plans and you answered. Now teach me your decrees and help me understand the meanings, meaning of your commands and I will meditate on your wonderful deeds. I weep with sorrow. Encourage me by your word. Keep me from lying to myself. And give me the privilege of knowing your instructions. We all have his instructions, but now we've got to get to know them and what? Live them. <clears throat> I have chosen to be faithful and I have determined to live by your regulation. So living by God's way is a choice. We have to make that choice every day. It doesn't take away our free will. You could go your own way at any given time. Try to do things your way and God's way and your way and God's way. <clears throat> but to mix it up is like you're being deformed because you can't mix the word and the world together. He tells us to empty ourselves in the world. It's a process. God can offer his grace and mercy. All right, that was a great scripture. Thank you for me shit out of here. Let's go to um, Job chapter 33. We're going to start there tonight. Yeah. Yep. It's been a long day. Mm. <clears throat> I don't know how many times I said, I can't wait to come to church tonight. Yes. Everybody's Crazy today. No. Everybody's nuts. <clears throat> then you gotta live with it, right? You gotta get in there and try to be good and try to live by God's ways and everybody around who's not. You just drop you drop right in the middle of that wall, you know? Amen. Yeah. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Alright, Job 33, let's go in verse 1. Elihu presents his case against Job. Elihu was the only one that God didn't rebuke, that understood God better than all of them. All the other three, God rebuked and um, Job had to pray for them. But you know, Elihu got most of it right, which is a good thing. So if you want to understand, if you listen to what Elihu is saying about the Lord, we can really get a grasp of his character. <clears throat> Verse 1. Listen to my words, Job. Pay attention to what I have to say. Now that I have begun to speak, let me continue. I speak with all sincerity. I speak the truth. For the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So how do we get here? The Spirit of God made us, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. He gives us life and he gives us breath. Comes from God. Answer me if you can. Make your case and take your stand. Look, you and I both belong to God. I too was formed from clay. So you don't need to be afraid of me. I won't come down hard on you. Well, all of his other friends came down hard on him, right? A good friend won't come down hard on somebody that's having some troubles. We get alongside of them and we share that suffering. Amen. That's what we're called to do as Christians. Verse 8. You have spoken in my hearing and I have heard your very words. You said I am pure and I am without sin. 
I am innocent and I have no guilt. God is picking a quarrel with me and he considers me his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks and he watches my every move. But you are wrong and I will show you why. For God is greater than any human being. He meant to that. So why are you bringing a charge to get a charge against him? Why say he does not respond to people's complaints? All right, now let me reiterate on that a little bit. We got the second turbo here. We go. Okay. Being informed, okay, brings a sense of security. Okay. It's natural to want to know what's happening in our lives. Job wanted to understand what was going on. He did. Why he was suffering. In previous chapters, we sense his frustration. Elihu claimed to have the answer for Job's biggest question. Why doesn't God tell me what has happened? Elihu told Job that God was trying to answer him, but that he was not listening. You can't listen when you're talking, okay? Okay. <laughs> Ever you misjudge God on this point? Now listen now, okay? If God were to answer all our questions, we would not be adequately we would not be adequately tested. How's He going to test us if He answers all our questions for us, right? What if God had said, "Job, Satan is going to test you and afflict you, but in the end you'll be healed and restored." Perhaps Job's greatest test was not the pain, but rather that he did not know why he was suffering. How many times do we go through things and can't understand why, and we actually question God, why is this happening to me, God? I'm a good pointing girl, I go to Bible study, I've been doing the right thing, but I haven't been looking in the mirror. Because there's behavior problems with me. Not just outward problems, there's inward behavior problems that need to be corrected, that I can't see. Who sees them? God sees them. And he sends situations in our life to bring them out. I, I sort of um, releases the pressure cooker. What's really going on inside of us, he causes what? Adversity to see the real you come out. And where's the real you? Behind closed doors at home. The adversities come out, right? You bicker with the spouse, the kids, Something, right? The real you comes out. God takes the pressure and says, Now look in the mirror. See, that's you. Yeah. See, it's not you sitting in church like this. It's you at home, barking and complaining and, you know, griping about things. That's the real you. And that's what needs to change. So now I'm going to put that in front of you until it does. And he's going to keep what? Turning it up until we tap all and accept it. Like we're just talking about traffic. It's like, all right, Lord, you know I'm your servant. Get rid of the traffic for me. <laughs> now he gives me more. How's he what? How's he making me more patient and accepting? By putting more traffic in front of me. By putting what? Elderly people in front of me driving. Buses. Police. I mean, if you drive down miserable Spring Avenue at any length of time, at any given time of the day, you'll be tested. <laughs> I call it miserable spring out. But anyway, it's a, it, the testing is what? Purifying me. Slowly but surely, I'm not getting so upset and trying to go around people and this and that. Now, I know a lot of people say, yeah, you know what, it's not really not a big deal in traffic. But when you have to get somewhere, when you have to be somewhere, and there's things that are slowing you down, it tends to what? Irritate me. I'm just being human. Can anybody sit and say they don't get irritated in traffic at all, ever? I digress. Maybe not as irritated as me, but nonetheless, we get irritated, right? But I haven't given any sign language, which is a good thing. I've been shutting up, talking to the Lord in the car like I'm on the phone. Yeah. Making the sign that goes, Lord, please do something. Man. Do something. I need, all, I need the Trinity in me right now. I need it all. And fill me up, please. People are killing me. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be good here, Lord. I'm trying to do your will. And the devil's trying to put everything in front of me to get out of it. Yeah. 
This is one thing about the devil. He knows exactly what irritates us. Out there. And he what? God uses it for good though. See? <clears throat> the devil wants to get us irritated, but God uses it to train us and test us. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Remember Joseph? He sold him into slavery in Egypt. That's the only way he would have got there. He would have never went there any other way, so God had to get him that way. And then he what? Rescued his whole, the whole, all his family and the people. Alright, so what if God has said, Job, Satan's going to test you and afflict you, but in the end you'll be healed and restored. Perhaps Job's greatest test was not the pain, but rather that he did not know why he was suffering. He understood the suffering was there, but he couldn't understand why. See, Job took a long look in the mirror, said, if there's anything in me to deserve this, then good. But he couldn't find anything that he was doing that would cause such a calamity. I mean, he lost his health. He lost his kids. He lost his livelihood. He lost it all. Except for what? what? His nagging wife. <laughs> the first thing she said, why don't you curse God and die? To him. There's a lot of comfort in that, right? I'm sure Job said, Lord, why'd you leave her? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But no, the Lord left her because... That was another test, right? Yes. That was another test. Okay, now listen. Our greatest test may be that we must trust God's goodness, okay? Even, even though we don't understand why our lives are going a certain way. We must learn to trust in God who is good and not the goodness of life. But the goodness of what? God. Trust in God. Mm -hmm. Listen, like, nobody guaranteed, God didn't guarantee us like a easy life down here. He guaranteed us what? The, the, the power to handle it right and to live right for him. Can anybody honestly say after becoming a Christian that their life was like a uh, bed of roses from here on in? No. <clears throat> well, some pulpits preach that. You're supposed to get blessed. You come to Jesus and get blessed. Everything's going to be good. Hmm. It's true. But the blessing comes from the testing. <laughs> All right, let's go to verse 14 here. All, right. all I know is this. This word is going out all over the world right now. And from the sound of my voice, um, these scriptures, somebody's going to find salvation. Mm -hmm. Nothing in me, but God uses me as the mouthpiece. This is how it goes. Verse 14. For God speaks again and again, though people do not recognize it. He speaks in dreams. In visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on people as they lie in their beds, he whispers in their ears and terrifies them with warnings. He makes them turn from doing wrong. He keeps them from pride. You know, that what? That conviction. That's God speaking to you. Conviction is God speaking to you, trying to keep you from being prideful. That's how he speaks, that still small voice and that conviction. You know what I'm talking about when you know, you know, you might question it, say, oh, I think I should do that, but you already know you shouldn't do it. Right. If you're questioning it already. You know, I got my little thing, what would Jesus do? Well, can you take Jesus with you in it? If you can, then that's good. But if you're gonna, if you can't, if you're gonna cover Jesus up, then you know it ain't from God, very simple. Now, look at verse 18. He protects them from the grave, from crossing over the river of death. While God disciplines people with pain on their sick beds, with ceaseless aching in their bones, they lose their appetite for even the most delicious food. That's funny because when, when my father um, took sick, the, the first thing I tried to do, I, I want to buy him some shop provolone cheese and some nice good Italian ham and some pepperoni, because that's what he used to like to eat, right? But he was sick. It, he, he, it, it, it didn't, he couldn't eat it. He lost his taste for it, you know? But I tried to tempt him with some tasty food because he wasn't, the cancer wasn't killing him, he wasn't eating. He died from not eating. Mm -hmm. He lost his appetite. But that's, that's what it says right here. That's what I'm reading and looking at it, right? Their flesh, look, they lose their appetite for even the most delicious food. Now, what Italian doesn't like a good uh, brujou and some uh, sharp provolone cheese? 
and a loaf of Italian bread. <laughs> Who's going to refuse that? That's what he puts in front of them. <laughs> look what it says. Their flesh wastes away and their bones stick out. You see somebody when they get sick, right? Uh, oh, man, my father was sick. Like, you can see all them. You know, I've seen pictures of them, you know? You don't really see it as it's progressing, but from before and after, when I've seen pictures of them sitting in the chair, like, yeah. you know, he looked like he was dead. You know, wow. I didn't realize it, though. It's sad. It's, it's sad. Life. But anyway, he's, he's going to be with the Lord. He can believe us. Huh? I'll see my family get there someday again. So there's hope there. Now look what it says. They are at death's door. The angels of death wait for them. But if an angel from heaven appears, a special messenger to intercede for a person and declare that he is upright, he will be gracious and say, rescue him from the grave, for I have found a ransom for his life. You ever notice sometimes people are really sick and they're going to die, but all of a sudden they recover. That's what they're saying here. An angel comes, it says, what? Well, declare that he is upright. He will be gracious and say, rescue him from the grave, for I have found a ransom for his life. Now, some people get sick, and they get, and the medication doesn't work, and the, same, and the person with the same thing, it works, and they heal from it. Yeah. So you know it's God who's the one who does it. Because yeah. if, if, it if it was from the medicine, it would have healed everybody. But it doesn't. It heals some, and some people it doesn't work at all for. So we got to give glory to God. Amen? Amen. All right. So before we go on, in verses 14 to 24, Elihu's point was that God had spoken repeatedly and in different ways. Okay? He spoke in dreams and visions, verse 15 to 18, through suffering, 19 to 22, and by meditate, mediating angels, 23 to 24. Job already knew that. Elihu was accusing Job of not listening to God, which was not true. He was hearing God. He was listening to God. That wasn't true. But God does speak to people, places, and things. Mm -hmm. All right, verse 25. Then his body will become as healthy as a child's, firm and youthful again. Remember um, King Hezekiah. God told him to get his affairs in order. He was going to die. He had some kind of probably was a tumor. But he said, Lord, I love you, and I, I want to serve you. And he said, well, because you have done that, he extended his life 15 years, and he recovered from it. So the angels helped him. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with anybody down here. You make a decision to serve the Lord, your best bet, if you want to keep going, if there's something going on with you, is to make a choice to serve the Lord so he can what? Heal you. Amen. <clears throat> It'll be the best choice you can make. If anything, you know, anything that's, I already made that choice, so... Faith that happens to me, I'm dependent on him. He's has got to a lot already. <laughs> and he healed me from a lot of stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. I can't even imagine. I, I can't get over half the stuff. Yet. I don't even know I'm still breathing. But anyway. He will declare, verse 27. He will declare to his friends, I sinned and twisted the truth. But it was not worth it. So, so the Greek version reads, but he, God, did not punish me as my sin deserved. So he gave him mercy. That's what it's saying here. Yeah. God rescued me from the grave. Look at verse 28. Rescued me from the grave, and now my life is filled with light. Yes, God does these things again and again for people. He rescues them from the grave so they might enjoy the light of life. Mark this well, Job, listen to me, for I have more to say. But if you have anything to say, go ahead, speak, for I am anxious to see you justify. But if not, then listen to me, keep silent, and I will teach you wisdom. All right, let's break into chapter 34. So Elihu was the youngest one out of them all. Mm. All right, Elihu accuses Job of arrogance. Oh boy. Mm. Then Elihu said, Listen to me, you wise men. Pay attention, you who have knowledge. 
Job said, the ear tests the words it hears, just as the mouth distinguishes between foods. So let us discern for ourselves what is right. Let us learn together what is good. For Job also said, I am innocent, but God has taken away my rights. I am innocent, but they call me a liar. My suffering is incurable, though I have not sinned. Tell me, has there ever been a man like Job with his thirst for irreverent talk? He chooses evil people as companions. He spends his time with wicked men. He has even said, why waste time trying to please God? Wow. He did say that back in the other chapter, remember? What good is living for God? People die the same way, evil get the same treatment. Doesn't matter. Remember, it doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. So Job was complaining back then. You want to go back and listen to him back then. He was complaining about that. If everyone knows that God, listen, he says, listen to me. Listen now, he says, verse 10. Listen to me, you who have understanding. Everyone knows that God doesn't sin. The Almighty can do no wrong. He repays people according to their deeds. Reaping and sowing, the principle of God never goes away. You always will harvest what you plant. He treats people as they deserve. Truly God will do no will not do wrong. The Almighty will not twist justice. Did someone else put the world in his care? Who set the whole world in place? If God were to take back his spirit and withdraw his, withdraw his breath, all life would cease. And all humanity would turn again to dust. So in other words, God's in control of every breath we take. Yeah. God's in control of the air. He's in control of the planet. Thank God he is, because people destroy this planet. Right? Thank God that God keeps it all together. Because if it wasn't for God, it would already be destroyed. I get an amen here. Yeah. Thank God he keeps an eye on his creation. All right, before we go on, in, ver in, ten, in verses 10 to 15, we were just talking about God doesn't sin, okay, and never acts unjustly. Elihu claimed, okay, throughout this book, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and Elihu all have elements of truth in their speeches. There's truth in everything they were saying, okay? Unfortunately, the nuggets of truth are buried under layers of false assumptions and conclusions. So they're like truths, but they're not, they're false assumptions, and the truths are like, they're out of context, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Under layers of false assumptions and what? Conclusions. Although we may have a wealth of Bible knowledge, listen to me now, a wealth of Bible knowledge and life experiences, we must make sure our conclusions are consistent with all of God's Word, not just part of it. Genesis, Revelations. Like I say all the time. All right, verse 16. Now listen to me if you are wise. Pay attention to what I said. Could God govern if he hated justice? Are you going to contemn the almighty judge? For he says to kings, you are wicked. And to nobles, you are unjust. He doesn't care how great a person may be, and he pays no more attention to the rich than to the poor. He made them all. Do we think because we're rich that God favors us more than somebody that's poor? Maybe in the world's viewpoint, people with prestige are honored more than people that are poor. But God sees no distinction in that, because he's the one who made the rich, and he's the one who made the poor. They're all his creatures. It says right here, he made them all. So who did God make? Everybody. Who did God give the ability to get rich? God did. Who did God give the ability to make it poor? God did. God did it all. But people want to get on it for them instead of God. See, whatever I have in my life today, the blessings and stuff, they're all from God, not from me. Because he's the one who accepts the circumstances and lines up conditions for me to get the blessings. He's the one that lines it all up for it to happen. 
It's been, if you go back and read Ecclesiastes, he says it's from being at the right place at the right time. Because God sets up you being at the right place at the right time for this to happen for you. Can I get an amen here? Yeah. He's the one. It's not by chance and it's not by coincidence. Nothing in life is by chance or coincidence. It's all divine. He knew you before you, the world was even created. He knew what, what you were going to do. He knew what you were going to choose. He knew it all and he still knows it all. And he still knows what you're going to do now. So I just made a choice that I'm just going to, listen, I'm not going to try to get away with anything with God because he knows me in and out already. I can't hide under the pulpit. You can't hide from God. You can't shut the lights off. Like people go out, when people want to do something, God, what do they wait? 10 o'clock and after, right? If somebody wants to go out, they go out at night. Why? Because they go out, nobody's going to see me. Well, God sees you in the night. God sees God. God sees everything. Can't get away from him. I remember, because I, for my other religion, God's looking, I used to look like, I used to be scared. He used to tell me that, you know, God's gonna, he's looking down at you right now. He's going to get you. I was like, you know, because that's what they taught me, you know? And they told me I had to go to confession and do all this crazy stuff. And like, I was like, I'm going to burn this place down because there's nothing good. I ain't, ain't nothing good in me there. I couldn't, I couldn't live up to that standard. Man, I was, that, I always thought God was like some cruel judge. That's what I was taught, you know? I was like, wow, I was scared of God. I didn't know how to I mean, I was never going to have a relationship with somebody that I thought was always judging me. So that made me go astray. But then when I found the truth, which is in your hand right now, I said, wow, that's not the God. That's not the God of the Bible they taught me about. That's the God of religion. The God of the Bible loves me unconditionally. He created me, he knows everything I'm doing, and he forgives me for everything. All I have to do is go to him and ask for his forgiveness. I don't have to go to anybody else, I go right to him. And it's in the Bible. So, wow, it set me free. To have a great relationship with God now. He's awesome. Okay, let's keep going here. Verse 20. He made them all. Okay, verse 20. In a moment they die. In the middle of the night they pass away. The mighty are removed without human hand. For God, listen, look at verse 21. This is, this is gives me a healthy fear of God. It says, for God watches how people live. And he sees everything they do. So in other words, you see, you know, when people get away with, you know, evil people are doing stuff out there. You think that God doesn't see it? Like he's like, like turning a blind eye to it. No, God sees it, but he, he gives everybody a free will. They will have to face him someday. Maybe the judgment isn't what we want to see the judgment, but nobody gets away with anything. Can I get an amen here? Because he says he sees everything that they do. Look what it says. No darkness is thick enough to hide the wicked from his eyes. We don't set the time when he will come before God in judgment. When we, when we will come before God in judgment. He brings the mighty to ruin without asking anyone, and he sets up others in their place. He knows what they do, and in the night he overturns and destroys them. He strikes them down because they are wicked, doing it openly for all to see. For they, they turned away from following him. They have no respect for any of his ways. So how many people turn away from him? They turn away from following him and have no respect for any of his ways. Unfortunately, even in Christianity, the people don't have any respect for his ways. They just come to church, do what they do, and then they live you, know, you never know the difference. There's no transformation. And it says right here, they turned away from following him. Because when you follow the Lord, there's no way that a transformation can't take place. Because the conviction is too great not to change. Because he's so close to you, he's always there looking. You have no choice but to change. Can I get any men there? Yeah. They cause the poor to cry out, catching God's attention. Right? People oppress the poor people. He hears the cries of the needy. 
But if he chooses to remain quiet, who can criticize him? How many people criticize God? Why did God let that happen? Right? They criticize God for letting things happen. No, it says it right here. But if he chooses to remain quiet, who can criticize him? When he hides his face, no one can find him. When an individual or a nation, whether an individual or a nation, he prevents the godless from ruling so they cannot be a snare to the people. Why don't people say to God, I have sinned, but I will sin no more? Or, I don't know what evil I have done. Tell me, if I have done wrong, I will stop at once. Does anybody go before, this? I don't know about you, but a lot of times I go before the Lord when I, there's known things that I've done, but I also ask him, Lord, there's probably there's things inside me that I know that are against you that I don't even realize. Tell me what they are so I can change them. I always go for a lot of that. Because there's things I, so we can't see sin. Sin is blinding. If we could see it, we'd be able to stop them, no problem. But we can't see it. Because the devil makes our, our sin seem so much satisfying. So we keep doing it. It's only a little sin. It's not a big sin. No, God doesn't look at a little sin or a big sin. Sin is sin. People evaluate sin. Oh, that's a big sin. That guy killed somebody. Oh, no, that's a big sin. That God robbed, you know, robbed the bank. Well, it's a little sin that I took a pack of sugar. But what's the difference? You stole it. So God said, you don't differ from the guy that stole a million dollars or embezzled it or stole something that didn't belong to you like a pen or a paper clip. You're a thief in someone in God's eyes. Can I get an amen there? Amen. So who are we to judge somebody like that? Amen? amen. I'm guilty before God of so many different things. Now I have trouble even stepping on a bug. It's crazy. Weird. You get these, I don't know, they call them stink bugs, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, like they're everywhere in the shop. That my shop is like full of them. They're flying around like um like mosquitoes. And they, and, they, and they smell, if you, if you squash one of them, yeah. they get this, it's a nasty smell. Really? No. Yeah, but that's not the reason why I don't step on them. <laughs> it's just that there's so many of them, but I, I kind of like, you know, get a piece of paper or something, and I like push it up the door. <laughs> I don't know, it's just something like, my heart, it's like marshmallow nuts, weird. Yeah. Before I had no problem stepping on things. <laughs> Unless, of course, it's a bee that's going to sting me. I'm not, it's, it's me against them. I'm not going to let them sting me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not stupid either, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, I mean, for a harmless bug, or even a spider, like I won't kill a spider because they help. Right. Spiders eat the bugs that have hurt people, yep. you know? So, right. they're just creepy. They are creepy to look at, you know what I mean? So I wouldn't want one crawling on me or anything like that. <laughs> go in your mouth. <laughs> they go. Oh, Let me tell you something, you go to bed, you don't know what's crawling on you. Things, <laughs> you don't, <laughs> things come out. It, I said that once, and I, that's all I think about. I put my mouth closed. <laughs> Something went in your mouth? They no, go in your said. mouth. Yeah, they do. Oh, Nobody so now I'm in bed, I, when I have my mouth open, I go. <gasps> yeah, wake up. Oh. What was that? Yeah, my throat. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. All right. All right, before we go on. The verses 31 and 32. Ellie, you ask why people don't usually turn to God. And ask him to point out sin in their lives. Okay? This goes beyond merely confessing our sins to God. To asking him to reveal more of our sinfulness. Right? To us. Ironically, Job had actually made this a regular practice in his life. In chapter 1 verse 5, which is why God considered him blameless and full of integrity. Okay? But how many of us can say we actually want God to reveal more of our sinfulness to us? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, some of us are at that point in immaturity with the Lord. But other people are like, no, I'm good. <laughs> Don't point anything out. I'm <laughs> Don't, I, I already know. But it's a good thing. Listen, you got to understand, God uses people, places, and things. When somebody says something to you, could be something good or something in your character that they might see. They might see. If somebody says something, when you evaluate it and say, oh, you know what? 
maybe they're just mad at me or they just don't like me. Then if someone else says something that's similar about you, you start to think about it, right? But like in the third time, you know, like I said, if somebody calls you a horse, the first time you say, oh, what's the second time? We ain't talking about it. The third time, get a saddle. Because you are. There's something in you that somebody right. God's trying to show you something about you. Who, who doesn't have flaws in their character? Can anybody sit here and say that there's nothing wrong with me? That's the height of arrogance and pride. There's something wrong with all of us. In the way we think, right? In our actions. Oh my goodness. The Apostle Paul, after like 28 years of walking with the Lord, saying how wretched he still was. There was sin living in him that does it. He don't understand himself still. So how can somebody that was walking so close to the Lord say that? Because that's the human nature. We have this, we're all born, there's not one person on this planet that's not a sinner. Okay, we're all addicted to sin. So it, it makes no point to say, I'm not as bad as someone else. All of us are bad. There's only one that's good as God. That's why when people judge each other from side to side, you'll always find somebody better. But when you judge yourself to Jesus, there's no, there's no, we're all the same. We all have anger, bitterness, resentment, rage, you know, everything lost in our hearts. We all have, we're born into sin. And we're all addicted to these behaviors. And we just can't stop doing it. That's why Paul says, who can free me from this body of sin and death? He said, thank God it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Or the word of God that will change us the way we think. So we can what? Actually get it right. Mm -hmm. Depending on how stubborn we are and how submissive we become, then we won't have to go through that much chasing it. Because God wants to lead us by, you know, when, like I said the other night, by, you know, when, you're, when your parents were mad at you, when you were doing something wrong, they give you the... Yeah. They give you the eye, right? When you get home, right? Well, God wants us to learn from the eye of his word instead of the rod of correction. So learn from the, the eye of the word. Say, you know what? God said that's not right. Just because I'm getting away with it doesn't mean judgment's not coming. It's going to come. So I just let it stop and turn from it now. His grace and mercy covers it and get back in line again. Instead of what? Getting chastened for it to get back in line. It's so much easier to just go by the word of God and say, oh, I'm going to stop. I know that's wrong, Lord. I know, Lord. I'm repenting and I'm confessing this to you, Lord. I'm turning and I'm coming back in that direction. Have mercy on me. And there you go. And you get back in. But if you keep going in that direction, you think he's going to, like any good father, he's going to try to stop you. And whatever he's going to do, he's going to do it. And then sometimes it's what? Painful. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now listen, how many, <laughs> Job made that a practice, which is why God considered it blameless. But how many of us can say we actually want God to reveal more of our sinful to us? I do. I do because you know what? The, the more purer I am, the better and clearer I can understand God, and better and the clearer I can hear His voice, and the better and clearer I can teach His word. The more the, the, more the sin that's taken out of me. Can I get an amen here? Amen. So I, every time, I always tell more. Whatever it is. And he uses my wife to reveal what it is. She's the ultimate. She's the ultimate. She tells me exactly what's wrong with me. That's just stop making me. Which is, I mean, of course you don't like it when it's happening, right? But, you know, when, you know, at the end of the day, when you look at it, say, you know what, she's right. She's right, you know. I don't like to say that at the beginning. I'm just right. But they are. My wife knows me. My wife knows me better than me. She already knows, like where I'm heading, with my thoughts, or what I'm doing, my action. John, you're going backwards. John, you're going backwards. What are you talking about? John, you're going backwards. I say, okay, and I'll take a look, and when I evaluate it, I am. It's a good thing. See, it's a good thing. See, when you want to mature, you don't get mad at someone that's correcting you. You thank them for correcting you, but. When you when you don't when you're still sinful, right? What are you talking about? What about you? You're worse than me. <laughs> That's when you go like this, pointing fingers, right? When you bounce it off to someone else, like when, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, right? What did, what did he, when when um 
It was the, it was the devil made me do it, he told, he told God. It was the devil. Then, then God said, what happened to Adam? It was the woman you gave me that made me do it. It ain't with me. Right? So when we're in recovery from sin, which all of us should be, when somebody says something to you, if you want to mature, you'll say, probably not thank you, but instead of attacking back and reviving back, because it's the truth that sets you free. See, it's the sin that keeps you in bondage. So if you want to stay in bondage, you won't listen to anybody. You just go your own way, your own stubborn way. How many people in this room are stubborn? You can raise all your raise hands because I know you so well. I mean, you're not stubborn as up. I've been with you walking with you for a long time now. <laughs> you want to sit in my office and I'll show you exactly what's wrong with you. <laughs> Don't be alarmed. <laughs> Just a little loose flash. I, I already know you very well. Just because I don't say much doesn't mean I don't know much about you. You know what I'm saying? So. Just saying, right? <laughs> I said, I'll let the wife tell him. <laughs> Hopefully they'll tell him. I'll let the husband tell the wife. I said, I, I can't say anything. All right, listen now. <laughs> God, look, fortunately, it's by God's grace that he does not show us all our sinfulness at once. Thank God for that, right? Now listen. Over time, as we grow in our relationship with Him, this is real now, okay? The Holy Spirit shows us more and more of our sin nature. See, the Holy Spirit is the ultimate one. Right? He uses people, but it's ultimately the Holy Spirit that drives the people to say it. You see? That's the, that's the Holy Spirit, okay? Spirit shows how much of our, our sinful nature. This is why people who are more spiritually mature better understand the depth of their sinfulness. Because... How many times do you hear? I'm a good person. I'm not that bad. Well, maybe you're not that bad compared to maybe somebody that's really somewhere further along down the road. But in all our eyes, we're all that bad. The Bible says we're all that bad. So that's just immaturity to say that. So if you want to mature, say, you know what, I'm just a bad person. All right, this is why people who are more spiritually mature better understand the depth of their sinfulness. Paul said that he was the worst of sinners. First Timothy 1.15. He penned in 13 epistles in the Bible, and he admitted that he was the worst sinner. Why do we have problems saying that? I don't have a problem saying I'm the worst sinner. I think I'm worse than Paul. I really think I am. In my sin nature. Or Jacob. Or all of them. That's just who I am, I know. Look at it says now, listen. When you're ready to grow deeper in your faith, listen to me now. This is important. This is so important for all of us. When you're ready to grow deeper in your faith, pray that the Holy Spirit will gently reveal more of the sin currently residing in your life. Confess that sin to God, change your habits, and trust in Jesus all the more that he has already forgiven you. Amen. He's forgiven us already, but he wants us to what? See it and confess it. And thank God who sent people in your life. If you really want, look, if you want, if you want to get better, you'll have someone in your life that'll what? Tell you like it is, so you can grow spiritually. And if you want that, to, you'll grow that way. Other than that, you'll get the, 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 the mind, oh, I don't want to hurt the feelings. Listen, you'll never grow if you don't hurt somebody's feelings. God wants us to grow beyond our feelings and into our faith. Okay? Spiritual maturity has nothing to do with feelings. Feelings are like gone. When you're spiritually mature, God loved his people. He sent them in exile for 70 years. And at the end of Job, when we start reading the end of this, he didn't pat Job on the back and say, poor Job. He said, sit down, Job. I got some questions for you. Because Job didn't understand God and he didn't act the right way. He didn't coddle him and make him feel better. He did none of that. Why do we always want to coddle people and make them help them to feel better when God's trying to correct them and change them? We get in the way of that happening. Can't get any men here. Thank God my wife don't coddle me. 
And she comes right up and says, she's raw as it is. But I need that. I need it. I do. And you all need it too, trust me. So if somebody's raw with you, accept it. Say, you know what, I need to change. Enough being stubborn. I need to change. I need to grow up. I need to change. Sitting in the pew doesn't change you. Doing what it tells you to do does. All right, let's just keep going. Let's finish this chapter. Verse 33. Must God tailor his justice to your demands? But you have rejected him. The choice is yours, not mine. Go ahead, share your wisdom with us. After all, bright people will tell me, and wise people will hear me say, Job speaks out of ignorance, his words lack insight. Job, you deserve the maximum penalty for the wicked way you have taught. See, he wasn't rebuking Job from what he did in the past. He was rebuking Job the way he handled the situation with God. That's what he was rebuking. He handled it the wrong way. Look what it says. For you have added rebellion to your sin, you show no respect, and you speak many angry words against God. Now, all of us can sit here and say, well, Job, look at everything that happened to him. Doesn't he have a right to talk like that? No. <clears throat> we don't have a right to act that way under any condition of God. We're supposed to worship and glorify him in any situation. So, it, it, it's not like, oh, you can glorify God when things are going good, but when there's adversity in your life, you can cuss him and curse him and complain about him. No, you'll get chased for that. All right? All right, so we're going to stop here. Then you told me, Michelle, we'll come, come back again. We'll pick up with... Um, Chapter 35. All right? Dave, you want to come up and close up? Yo. Lord, thank you for this beautiful church, Lord, and this opportunity we have each week, Lord, to gather together in your house and hear your word. Lord, may we always be mindful, Lord, that we represent you and the Holy Ministries and all that we do, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that you would give us a desire. Take what we learn here, Lord, and use it to make the changes needed in our lives, Lord, in order to live the life that you called us to live, Lord. And a desire, Lord, to love others with that same kind of unconditional love that you have for us, Lord. Lord, I just pray that you would give us the strength to only seek you, Lord, and your word through the good times and the bad, Lord. Lord, I just pray that continue to watch over the church and our families, Lord. We just pray for those who are sick and not feeling well and just going through a tough time, Lord, that you can touch their hearts and we'll be assured that they're going to leave them or forsake them and that you're with them always. And we pray this from holy precious name. Amen. 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 All right. Thanks, Dave. All right. We're going to close. We're going to watch your video.